Hi there and welcome to this episode of our web regular webinar series. Really excited for this one. We've got Chris Walker. Um, Chris is CEO and founder of Refine Labs and also he is the host of the State of Demand Gen podcast. So unless you've been living under a rock, I think you will have heard or seen um, Chris around in the B2B marketing SaaS world um, for sure. And today we're going to talk about a topic which I think is really interesting it's all about the dark funnel which i believe is something that you coined chris but i'm sure you can give us more insight on it um, in a bit but essentially it's those places the buyers are engaging and making decisions that no attribution software um, or tracking can account for um, so yeah chris welcome to um welcome to this webinar hey everyone really excited to be here alice i remember it's been uh probably close to two years now since we were on a webinar together and i understand that you've made some changes in how you're marketing and would love to kind of like talk through uh talk through a little of that before we get into it we're letting people roll through here i see some attendees coming in we'll probably give everyone a couple minutes before we really jump in so if you want to talk through your journey to help some people that'd be awesome yeah definitely i think it's quite interesting the background of chris and my relationship i guess i first invited chris um on a webinar back yeah like almost two years ago um on another brand that we run called Maltastic and the topic was the ebook is dead and I wanted Chris to talk well we were going to argue the topic Chris obviously very much against like gating an ebook um and me kind of proposing why I think it's still like a good idea um, and I'm, I'll be like honest complete skeptic of a lot of what Chris was saying and talking about and still a strong firm believer in um, some of the more traditional marketing tactics and their place in b2b SaaS um we've come a long way since then I mean it was like probably two months ago I had my whole marketing team get together and we actually listened to a whole load of the state of demand and podcast and tried to unpick the Chris Walker strategy as we call it um, and build our own playbook based on a lot of the insights I mean we don't a hundred percent adopt everything um, I'll be honest because it's just it's this the stage in the journey that we are and the type of business etc but we pick the bits that really work for us and actually since having adopted it we've seen a 44% uplift in our direct inbound demo requests um, every month, which is amazing. Um, we're probably only three months into our journey, so we've still got a lot to learn, a lot to dig into. So I'm excited to do that today um, and, yeah, kick off with some of these topics. Cool. Yeah, what good to go. Cool. cool. Um, so I think the first thing I wanted to cover is, like, it's a question about um, essentially thinking through how much you'd be willing to pay to get your content in front of the right decision makers in your target accounts. Like, I think this is a really interesting um, insight that you've brought to me and my team and also that you, you're sharing a lot on, you know, all of your platform, various platforms. I mean, when you frame things in this way, it's very clear, you know, the argument against creating friction and gated content in its traditional format. Um, I guess for those starting out and like trying to look at this type of thing for the first time, Chris, how would you go about building your first funnel of content, like offers and channels? Like, let's just say for now, because I know you talk about this a lot, like we've done all of our customer research, that base is covered, we know our customers inside and out. Um, how do we actually go about building the advertising and content strategy now that, so we can get stuff live um, and we can start actually capitalizing on this dark funnel? Do you have like some, some examples of that? Yeah, for sure. So just for, for everyone, I'm going to kind of like rewind a little bit and sort of explain um, explain the dark funnel, um, kind of like why it's important, some of the things that I see, and then let's move into some of the tactics. I think setting the, uh, setting the foundation will be helpful for people. Sure. Um, so hey, everyone, I'm excited to uh, share this with you. I've been um, in B2B marketing for more than 10 years for, for those that don't know me, and I've been seeing these types of effects in my own marketing since 2014 when I was running uh, an e-commerce uh, store B2B or sorry B2C um, on my own and started running Instagram ads and then seeing how Instagram ads was influencing conversions through other channels without attribution and have continued to figure out better ways to measure and explain it and so I'm looking forward to doing that with you here and so the long and short of it in terms of the dark funnel and just by the way this is not a uh, term that I coined. There's blogs about it dating back to 2016 from intent data providers. And so um, I'm just I'm just communicating my position on it, which is actually quite different than how intent data providers use it. They use 
uh, the dark funnel in their messaging to say, hey, come and uncover these insights that we can track so that you can do outbound sales. And I'm saying to marketers, here are all the things that you aren't able to track. Here is a different way to execute on them and why it's important. And so it's a little bit of a different position here, but I'll just go through it in a little bit of detail. So first off, the reality of the situation is that B2B buyers are discovering, researching, and evaluating products in places where companies can't track. Some of those places would be a, a podcast, third-party events, word of mouth, which is incredibly impactful and I believe influences the most B2B buying decisions right now, organic social, community, other forms of PR. The thing that collects all of these channels is that it's either direct communication between peers or it's happening on third-party content platforms that have privacy policies and other things that don't that they don't give you any of this data to track. And so because companies can't track it effectively, most of them just don't execute on them. Or if they do execute on them, it's a throwaway and they're just kind of like mailing it in, posting a LinkedIn post on the company page every once in a while, not recognizing that it, these can be the most impactful channels that a business could do today. And they are major business drivers when executed appropriately. I think that's shown in the growth of my company and some of the companies that that we do work for with no funding from zero to close to 10 million in revenue in a very short period of time. And so like there's big opportunities here for people that recognize the opportunities and move. I'm trying to set the stage so people understand the magnitude of the opportunity and the situation and the potential impact or implications of not moving on it. Because if you don't move on these opportunities, what's going to happen eventually, if it's not already happening, is that one of your competitors is going to figure out how to execute here you're not necessarily going to be able to see it. And they're going to start creating demand and siphoning off market share from that would normally go to you. That's what we do against some of our competitors right now. And for we've been doing it for years in LinkedIn and a podcast publicly. And still, most of our competitors haven't even started executing there effectively. And so what, what we're seeing right here and what other companies can see is that if you are able to hit this right, you have years of execution on mature platforms where all of your buyers are and your customer and your competitors aren't, which gives you a major opportunity to start creating demand and educating people. And so. So I guess on that, like, I think the tricky thing sometimes is getting started. Like we, we obviously were, we, we were skeptical then we bought in and then we were like, okay, now what? So like, how are we actually going to start executing some of this and build out some of these funnels? Yeah, so let, let's go into it right now. So the the good thing for everyone on this webinar is that the core infrastructure of the funnel is already built. It's already there. You already have customers coming through it, but most companies just don't recognize how much better it is than other things and they don't focus on optimizing that specific funnel. And so the when you move into executing the dark funnel, my strong recommendation is that you align on a holistic high intent website funnel where somebody would come to your website, say, hey, I'd love to talk to your sales rep about buying this, or hey, I'd love to see a demo, or if you don't publish pricing, hey, I'd love to get pricing on this, indicates that they have clear intent to buy, that they're firmographically qualified, and that they've asked to speak to a sales rep. And when you have those three actions happen, your win rates are significantly better than any other channels. Sales cycles are super short. Um, customer acquisition cost is very low. And so companies have this set up already. Now what we're talking about is how to optimize that funnel. And so when we go through it, I mentioned one funnel here, high intent conversions that move through into sales qualified opportunities and then into revenue. That's happening right now for companies. And if you looked at it, you would realize that somewhere between 60 and 80% is what we typically see. 60 to 80% of marketing source revenue comes through that way. Um, however, companies take all of their marketing dollars and all of their effort to create into a lead gen funnel where they go into other channels to collect leads that have low intent, that are firmographically qualified based on job title or company size, but have no intent to buy. And then they try and have their sales team do outbound sales to people that don't want to buy. And when you use that funnel, the win rates are super low. Sales productivity is really bad. Customer acquisition cost is really high. Advertising CAC is very high. Sales cycles are longer than they should be. And so you have two very different funnels that are happening inside of your business right now. Or for most companies, this is what's happening. 
and they take it and they just put them all into one big pool of MQLs and they don't see the two big differences based on the intent of buyers. So we did actually quite an interesting thing. We spit this out, right? We looked at it and exactly as you said, 10% is our conversion rate lead to meeting booked on old funnel, let's say EBIT download, MDR cadence, follow up, 10%. And then on the direct inbound intent demo request, 45%. So like there's a massive, massive difference there um and obviously but i think the barrier was like well great yeah we all know we want direct inbound demo requests but how do we get more of them mm -hmm. and so to add a little bit more color here i see marketing's response uh, demands responsibility in three core buckets you have pipeline marketing at the bottom companies that are in pipe this would normally fall into abm or field marketers or sales enablement like pipeline marketing the next one is capture demand and so in capture demand, you're trying to have people that are already looking to buy what you sell or are already brand aware and convert those people and get them into a meeting with a rep as efficiently as possible. Capture demand, companies overspend on capture demand. You see that in places like Google search. And then you have this big place, well, <laughs> you have this big place called create demand in the dark funnel. And this is the opportunity. And this is what companies aren't doing right now. What they're doing instead is they're running MQL, or lead gen, MQL marketing automation, MQL score, outbound sales to someone that doesn't want to buy. And so what I'm suggesting for people is that you remove that funnel that's clearly not, if you just look at the data, it's clearly not working as well as it, as it should be to justify continuing to do it based on the sales resources, the advertising spend, the marketing time invested in money, and instead move to executing in the dark funnel. And when we execute there, we need different metrics, we need different expectations on time, and we need a different mindset when we actually go out and begin to execute there. And so when you want to start getting it going, I suggest building from the bottom up, right? So let's exclude pipeline marketing for right now, because I think that somebody else in the organization should be responsible for that unless demand gen's running over the top air cover to accounts and pipes. So you start to capture demand. There's no sense in starting a podcast or trying to run you know linkedin ads at high spends or, or anything if when somebody gets to your website they don't convert and you can't get them to the person that they want to talk to and they don't move through a process and buy and so if you're not able to do that uh, repeatedly and consistently then optimizing that part of the process is a great place to start so things like lead handoff optimization we help companies with tools like chili piper to have someone be able to book a meeting with their rep directly fr from that and see increased conversion rates from what you said, like 45% to 80, 60 to 80% just by using that as opposed to an SDR outbound cadence. And so optimizing that part of the process and, and then figuring out what are the channels and how are we going to execute up here and how are we going to measure against it? And so what I'm suggesting for people more recently is that you continue to build up the funnel. So you start high intent conversion down is very well set, but we need to build up. And so what would you look at above that? The things that I'm suggesting is demo page views and demo conversion rate is a good leading metric on that obvious and for, for non paid traffic. So you wouldn't just be running a bunch of ads to drive people into a demo form because your conversion rates would go down on the form. They would also go down for, for uh, sales, and that's not what we want as marketers. We want to optimize the entire process, not one part of the process at the expense of other ones. And so demo page views, and then I would look at homepage organic and direct traffic. And then once we're out of Google Analytics, once we're out of our own website, we need to start looking at the individual channel level to understand how those channels are influencing more people to go in. This is a place where marketers get scared because they've been trained for the past 10 years or longer by marketing automation vendors to look for direct attribution to prove to themselves that something is working or it's not. And what we need to do when we move into this place is we need to use our brains and we need to look at correlations and we need to listen to the audience in order to start to figure these things out. And so we've made some evolutions in terms of attribution to help people with this. We're doing it on our own website right now. Some of our customers are implementing it. And so I want to run through that real quick. And so yeah, that sounds helpful. Let's do it. Yeah, so in attribution, most companies only operate with one of these things. I'm suggesting that you have four total total things when you're going to operate this way to be able to demonstrate to executives that it's working, be able to, for you to understand and optimize what's working as well. 
And so step one would be multi-touch attribution. It's industry standard. Most companies already have that. I understand. Um, we use it as well. The thing is that we need to recognize that that tool can only measure certain things and it's going to give a majority of the credit to things that are on a desktop computer, computer that are easy to measure on a website, organic search, direct traffic, or performance marketing. And so we acknowledge that those things are easily measured. We know that Google Ads is going to be clear tracking, at least at the last touch standpoint. And then we need other measurement methods to understand what's going on in the quote unquote dark funnel. So one thing that we're doing is what I call self-reported attribution. We're using it on our form. So if you go to refinelabs.com slash uh, whatever the, the high intent conversion, I don't know what the URL is, you're going to see the last part on the form is required. It says, how did you hear about us? And we've been using that for, I think I only implemented it three days ago. And I just want to compare people for, for um, so they understand the insights that we're getting and the insights that you would be able to get if you executed this as well. And so um, three companies have submitted the form as of like two days ago when I pulled this data. Um, the first company, HubSpot, tagged at organic search, multi-touch attribution software tagged at organic search, and how did you hear about us was the State of Demand Gen podcast. The next company, uh, HubSpot, was direct traffic, multi-touch attribution was organic search, and how did you hear about us was a recommendation from a friend. And the third one was HubSpot says organic search, multi-touch attribution says organic search, and how did you hear about us says LinkedIn and podcast. And so this data, we already knew, right? Like I already knew that this was happening. Other companies may not be able to recognize it specifically the amount of word of mouth. So other companies that we know have implemented something like this or have started to call close one deals and just ask the primary contact how they heard about us. And they're hearing the same things, word of mouth, podcast, organic social communities, all of these places that are driving revenue where companies aren't paying attention because they can't measure it. So they don't recognize the opportunity. Um, and so I'm suggesting that you put other levers in or other measurement mechanisms in to triangulate what's going on outside of just standard, like MarTech attribution. Um, which I guess like the marketing question on that, like, do you think there's going to be drop off on the form? This is another field. Um, so Common conversion rate optimization principles would say don't add more fields to the form. We didn't add more fields. We took out a field and put this one in instead. And so um, that's one thing. Secondly, if somebody's on my form and they aren't going to convert because there's an extra field, then I don't want to ha have a sales conversation with them anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it's the common conversion rate optimization principles that people have ingrained in their mind were built and set in 2011, when we were optimizing for the most leads possible at the lowest cost, not understanding that what happens when you convert more people that aren't ready to buy is just your sales team does manual effort to filter those out as opposed to that you get in, you filtering them out on mar the marketing level. And so when I look at this, I think about it with a sales productivity lens on. I don't want to pass people to sales that are going to move to close loss after a meeting. It wastes 30 minutes of my rep's time. And so, I guess as well, like it's not going to be a hundred percent accurate. Like if I see a LinkedIn ad that I haven't engaged with, but I've seen it and I've seen it a few times, and like I come to your form because of other things. Like I've probably heard about you from various sources, mm -hmm. not one source. Like, but it's an indicator. Yeah, it's not perfect, but it gives you a mm -hmm. look that you don't get right now. Um, mm -hmm. The second thing that I've recommended for people and and companies have taken me up on this and gotten similar results is what they call people. You don't just get the I heard about you on the podcast. You can actually dig deeper and hear more about what's going on. It requires a different, a, a, just a different mindset from a marketer to go out and do those things to learn what's going on in order to execute here. And so we've talked about so far, just the why, what's going on, the core funnel and attribution. And now I think it's a good spot to, uh, to move into some execution. Yeah. That would be great. I think I'm. Well, I, we're really interested in this because we're obviously doing it right now. So, um, and and a few things like we have questions over, which I'm sure you can give us some insight in. Is like on, on an operational, practical level, things like um, content refresh and content exhaustion. Um, actually, defining the types of content to go in each phase. So, like how we're running it right now, 
rightly or wrongly, is we'll have a wide audience, like in our ICP, the virtual run, um, what we call awareness phase one ads too, which are like video, because video views are much cheaper and we can retarget them better on Facebook and on LinkedIn. And then we'll build like a phase two funnel where we actually start to, where we start retargeting those video views with more product specific content. So like what would, what I guess people call MOFU, um, more middle of the funnel, like case study led, um, actual videos from like some of our product webinars so they can see the, the product in action. Like some things called like our wow moments. And then we have the phase three, which is the thing that really isn't working so well for us at the moment. Like so sometimes it is, sometimes it's not so much, which is like the very bottom of the funnel. And it's that like value prop, like try and push to the request demo piece. And I say it's not working. We don't know. They're not taking the action on the on the demo, but we've seen the correlation uplift in inbound. So actually saying it's not working is not necessarily completely accurate. Yeah. So this is a um, a good point of clarification and a difference in how how we operate. And so think about what we, what I mentioned in pipeline marketing, capture demand, create demand. The idea is that people are in certain places when they want to buy enterprise SaaS. They go to Google, they look at review sites, they um, go to your website. And so in those places, I'm in convert mode because it's clear that someone has intent. And when we're ever somewhere else where it's clear that the buyer does not have intent, Nobody logs into LinkedIn to convert on our demo, right? They log into LinkedIn to get information, to, to um, connect with peers, to, you know, trying to do some biz dev, whatever yeah. they're trying to do. And so I take that mindset into all of these channels. And so instead of building it out, like someone would do like a funnel, which just for clarification, if you're going to build out that funnel, which came from something like selling a $99 course or selling $60 shoes with performance marketing, it works there. It works there because it's a transactional, single stakeholder, small price sale that can be converted over the internet. And so you don't have a sales resource, it's just a huge different nuances. And so when we're in B, like B2B, multi-stakeholder, relatively complex deals, I operate in a very different way, which is that I have the entire audience that I'm trying to go after. And you can segment them by industry. If you have specific content, you can segment them however you want. So we might have a one to many, we might have several one to fews, and we might have one to ones if we have specific content for those people. And it is a ongoing communication channel. And so I'm not trying to convert anyone ever. I'm not trying, I'm not, that's not my goal. My goal is to people consume the information and then I get the capture in the other places where people are trying to convert. Go to, yeah. So okay. Putting those two things yeah. off. So and another thing that I think is important to acknowledge is that just because someone saw a video doesn't necessarily mean that they're ready for a case study. And just because someone hasn't seen your video doesn't mean that they're not ready to convert. And so I, instead of like trying to segment it off like a funnel, I give everyone everything. Um, it's almost like treating it like an organic channel, except you're obviously going to be driven more toward product marketing and, and other, you're going to have a different mix of content than pure organic. Um, but I think about it more like organic, I'm going to post and I'm going to try and get everyone that is important to see and consume it so that they understand more things. And as they start to understand more things, they're going to have more consideration for our product and more affinity to our category and a higher likelihood to choose our brand. And so that's the way that I think about it, um, in like a LinkedIn standpoint. That's, so that's great. And then, but on, and, on, and then on the content refresh point, um, mm -hmm and content exhaustion is kind of linked together, I guess. Um, like a big thing, a switch that we've made is our content writers are specialized now and actually been asked to be like journalists and find the story. Like we don't just want to be writing for Google as, um, yeah, as has been the case or like planning a long content calendar like six months out. Um, but I guess it's easier said than done. Like talking about a hot topic um, is not, super repeatable necessarily all the time so I'm interested in that point like on content um yeah content exhaustion like how like how much should you harp on about um something that you've stumbled on that is actually quite hot but like you need to obviously branch out and move forward but what's the signals for doing so and secondly like how often and how do you operationalize refreshing the content for these audiences like obviously we have like the frequency measure but yeah just interested to yeah. your thoughts on that the major distinction here is that we 
need two strategies. We need a paid strategy and an organic strategy. And so inside of paid at the beginning for people that haven't started on this, like I'm going to start with product marketing, social proof and work my way, quote unquote, up. Um, and that's one important thing, but there are a lot of things that are better served organic if you can build them. And so I recommend once you start moving on paid that you actually start to build organic because if you do that, then as people see the ads, they might actually subscribe and then get into a different stream, whether that's LinkedIn organic podcast, you know, email, if you want to do it that way, all of those. And so having these two strategies running in parallel is, is critically important because then you can see that if you were doing more journalistic, maybe it goes organic first. And then if it gets traction organic, then you quote unquote, boost it to pit targeted paid. And so it's thinking about it sort of in a, in a different way. You could obviously just move directly to paid and that's the recommendation to do it. If you don't have an audience built or core organic distribution channels, and you believe that it's going to make an impact and move the needle to someone buying. But when we're doing paid, there's a, there's a key sort of like distinction that's hard to explain that when we're paying for things, it truly needs to serve a business objective, at least the way that I look at it. And so there are, a lot, I think a lot of people listening that see like journalistic things like that might get something that's so far away from business objectives that it may actually not be worth paying to distribute. I don't know. Um, but that's just a consideration for people to make. Yeah, I think that's important. If that makes sense. That's great. It's really helpful. Um, I think on this point, like I've, I want to go into um, like the idea of how you can actually make content be your competitive advantage and like what how you've seen companies do this well. So um, I guess like one companies that you're working with and a lot of companies that we talk to as well, like it's always like a re people are worried about how they're going to do better than their competitors because they don't have the same money, budget, number of people in the team etc um but I always feel like like whenever I've started out started a company a startup like content's always been the first thing because that's the one thing you don't necessarily need money for and it can be a competitive advantage if you do it well so I just wanted to hear from you like what what companies have you seen doing this well what are they doing to do it well and like in a practical way like how can people kind of adopt that and start taking on that approach yeah, I mean, our goal at Refine Labs is to show people what they should be doing, right? And so, like, I think that we're a, a good model for this. And another note is that, like, we have a lot of what people would consider competitors. I don't even, I don't know very many of them. I don't pay attention to them. I don't think about it. Um, I focus on the customer. My customer tells me the things that they're not getting from current providers. So I, instead of looking at the provider and then guessing what the customer wants, I just talk to the customer. The customer tells me where the gaps are and then I just execute the strategy. So I think as a core like principle, ignore, not ignoring, but spending less time looking at what your customers are doing or your competitors are doing and spending way more time at what your customers are doing actually give you way better in way better insights about what to do and um, can, can, you can avoid following competitors down a path that's not really helpful, right? Like I get emails from CEOs that are our customers that are like, why aren't our Google ads showing up on this term? And I'm like, because your competitors spending $300,000 a month, wasting all of their money. Like, that's why we don't, that's why we don't bid on this term that makes no sense. And so to get back into the, um, the content route, I think there are, several things that are core to making a content strategy work and i think that a majority of companies miss on at least one of these but probably probably more of them one you need a subject matter expert that is ideally authoritative in the world of your buyer so um if you are selling to chief information security officers you better have somebody that's producing your content that chief information security officers get value out of trust and that under that has done their job before ideally right so when we were building this beginning when i was an employee we were selling to neonatologists icu physicians and we had i see an icu physician and a neonatologist that worked at the company that had other jobs but would be participate in the content because that's the only way that people were going to actually get value from it and therefore consider paying attention to it and so subject matter expert, I watch companies use, the, especially ones that don't sell to sales at marketing, sell to a, a different buyer than that, have marketers writing content for chief information security officers or have an agency who has a, a 
marketer writing content for chief information security officers and it's just blatantly obvious why that content's not getting consumed it's because it's written by someone that can't provide value to those buyers and there's nothing wrong there's plenty of buyers that i can't provide value to it's just acknowledging whether or not you have the right person to do that subject matter expert the next one which almost every company fails at is consistency and so we've been able to uh, at refine labs over the past almost 18 months now produce three podcasts a week so we've done a, almost 170 podcast episodes in 18 months um and that level of consistency at the podcast and event level has been able to drive consistency through micro content distribution whether that's paid or organic on a variety of different channels including youtube um linkedin would be another one and then we're experimenting with instagram and others and so the top level content pillar or pillars or events can be a, co a content pillar drives good content down that can then be repackaged and distributed for social channels i think is the number two would be um consistency and then i kind of alluded to number three is distribution and so i see a lot of companies right now that m they might be creating good content. I was in a position at one point when I was, I thought I was creating good content on LinkedIn, but I hadn't figured out distribution. I was posting, I had a thousand followers. Those thousand followers didn't log into LinkedIn or didn't care about marketing, which is why I got three likes on my posts. And so figuring out how am I going to be able to get this content in front of somebody is a critically important thing that I don't think marketers really think about. I think they're used to posting it on their blog and hoping people find it or posting it on their blog and then sending one email and then hoping people find it, right? Yeah. And, and not so, being scared, I think, to pay to get it in front of people as well. I think that's the other thing that we yeah, so often don't think about. Initially, that is the recommendation. And I think that companies should have some type of balance on this over time. But if you are a, a venture funded software company and you have growth targets in order to get to the next round, or you just you you just need to, you, you do, time, speed and time matter in those situations. And so, developing an organic strategy that can take you know 6 12 18 or more months to really get an impact the recommendation is to spend money to distribute that information in order to guarantee delivery to drive results more quickly while you build up the organic um and so that would be the recommendation on distribution i've been doing this for a really long time using facebook instagram linkedin youtube to target who we want to get to and then give them information with the core understanding of my belief in 2011 marketing's job was to collect leads to help sit to help sales get contact information so they can try and do sales and i believe that marketing's new role in 2021 moving forward and probably it started before this is to get people to educate people to a level where they are ready to buy and they come to you to buy and it's a completely different mindset about what you're trying to do. So you're not just going to go and give an ebook, convert someone, give them a score and move them in. You need to think about it a lot more methodically about, okay, this person has never heard of our brand, doesn't understand the category, doesn't understand the problems we solve. How do we move someone through their buying process at scale without needing a salesperson to give them a demo? It's a really interesting way to think. And then just quickly on this, so you, you obviously done all these like 200 episodes of podcasts and et cetera. Like one thing we found almost as a problem, but it's a good problem to have is like, as we've been scaling up the content creation and production, we've got so much content that like, how do you come up with an operational process and schedule and how often like, are you meant, should you be refreshing that? Like are there best practices around this and like, what's the best yeah, way to look at it? specifically on distribution right mm -hmm. yeah and so on the content distribution side it's a good like you mentioned it's a great problem to have if you have more content than you, you can distribute right and so when you have more content the recommendation is to start siphoning some of that off to organic to get more reps and build that piece in, and then you have, can be more selective about what you run on paid. It's the same thing that happens to me in organic right now. I have more than a thousand videos in a, in a box folder that I've never posted because we're creating more content than we can distribute. Um, so it's a good problem to have. And then those videos can then either go on YouTube, they can get distributed on our company page, they can get used in other ways if we want. When you're on paid, 
typically the free, depending on your audience size, typically the frequency level that I'm looking at is somewhere between two and three. Although I understand in certain situations, you can go longer than that and, and not have degrading results. And so it's sort of like understanding your audience and then checking frequency and then looking at when you get these degradations. Um, back in the day, I would see like degradations and click through rate and, and increases in cost per click at somewhere around, around two frequency. And then again, at six. And so it's about understanding that. I don't recommend going higher than six in almost all cases. If you're going more than six, it's either because you continue to drive major results or you don't have enough content to refresh. Normally people run in high frequencies because they don't respect the content and the creative that goes in the channel. So they just pick one video and put it in there and say, okay, $10,000, push a button and go and never look at it again. And that when we're running in this model, I recommend checking these things frequently. Looking yeah. at frequency, looking at click through rate, understanding if you're running more ads, several different variations, which one's performing better. Um, so thinking about those components, but to answer your question, like on the content set, I'm somewhere between two and six, probably closer to two. Okay, makes sense. That's great. Because I think like we got into the trap of like new piece of content, let's get it up it, on the paid channel, and then actually we don't give content that's only been up two weeks, like even time to optimize. And so yeah, you can get into a trap of like mm -hmm. really another it, alternative it, that you can put together a one campaign, run a lot of different assets, and then pr pretty quickly understand which ones are performing best, shut the other ones off, and just let the audience decide which piece of content was the best as opposed to us making our own decision on it. Both ways can work. Yeah, makes sense. That's great, cool. Um, I think then, also guys, please ask questions throughout. Like, I'm sure you've got questions for Chris, and this is the time to get them answered. So just put your questions in the chat and we'll get um, cover those as well. Um, marketing metrics. So I think this is an interesting one. It's interesting to me because um, I'm definitely a data-driven marketer. Like I like to measure absolutely everything. Um, I think a lot of my pushback originally on your strategy and kind of like the things you were talking about was I just felt like it's easy to say don't measure anything and like just we all want direct demo requests, but how do we actually make it happen? And I need to know the metrics to get there. And I know my it, it may even be 10% lead to meeting book but I know it's 10% I can scale that that's predictable like I'm, that's what I want to know so there's always that kind of friction um but now I think I have you know obviously have like the correlation piece is kind of enough for me and and, and I think also earn the right um that was a big thing like you know starting out as a CMO in a VC backed SaaS company where you've got big targets like I couldn't just get away with kind of saying don't worry guys just trust me like it's going to be fine um had to actually hit the number hit the number repeatedly and then got some room to kind of say okay well i want to try this and i'm going to separate off siphon off some budget and like this is how i'm going to track it and kind of go from there so um how can you help people to who are in like similar situations kind of go to senior management and like actually determine like what the metrics that we should I mean you've already mentioned quite a few of them at the start um the metrics that we should be looking at and to help them push forward like this new way of working over MQL number um you know all the all the stuff we want to get rid of yeah and so the way that I help executives understand this and the way that I help marketers um put together this story for executives is if you look at all of the mark like most companies are doing like Alice was doing and what I was doing long before that is everything is tracked 100% and then you have everything tracked marketing sourced and you can go in and look at what was the progression from lead to opportunity to qualified op to closed one. And then what I recommend marketers do is look at the, the opportunity stage, the latest stage where you're going to win at least 20% of those deals. And so you can go in, calculate win rate by stage, and you can figure out it's gonna be late. It's, for some companies, it's gonna be beyond SQO. It might be stage four. A lot of other companies, it's gonna be stage two or three. You have that stage, and then you start measuring on that. And so, and then when you start measuring on, for most companies, which just call it sales qualified opportunity, and they're, you know that they're predictably going to win in at least 20%, and then you start measuring on that and then you track back where are those people coming from Wh where are the what's the source of the people that are coming and becoming sqos and when you actually go and look at that what you're going to find 
is that they come from two core places among others, but the two major ones are going to be organic search and direct traffic. And when you look at those two sources, just like when I made the example of looking at the self-reported attribution, it's saying it's organic search and direct traffic. And so people are back at HQ being like, oh, our SEO is working so good. Let's keep doing that. Not seeing that and, and not even looking that, oh, like actually people are just funneling through Google when they're ready to buy and we don't have tracking on the things that got them there. And so um, when you actually start to identify that, if, if you do see that, because I see that in most companies, organic search and direct traffic, add that field, see what's actually going on, and then you can actually start to point to other things. Now, if you don't have a podcast, if you're not executing on LinkedIn, if you're not in communities, you probably aren't going to get those as answers from uh, on, on that thing. You might get more word of mouth than, than executives expect, but you sort of need to have the system going. Like Those channels need to be driving an impact for someone to get to that form, convert, and report that that's where they heard about you. And so there's sort of a little bit of a chicken and the egg thing. But when we get back to it, aligning on sales qualified opportunities will show you what things are not working as well and not only the organic search and direct traffic and the other things that are working but it'll show you all of the things that you're doing that are not working and so what we typically see there are anything that you could bucket into low intent lead gen and so content syndication uh, ads to content downloads organic content downloads anything that hits an mql score those types of low intent sources and what alice mentioned was they only convert to meetings at 10 percent, but then track it all the way to customer and what you're going to find is the attrition across the entire stage leads you that you're going to win about one in a thousand of those leads and so yeah you get one in ten to a meeting but then another one in ten drop off through another stage and then another ten, one in ten drop off another stage and you end up winning about one in a thousand leads and your sales team needs to have do some type of communication with somewhere between a hundred and a thousand people to win one deal. And if you change, if you ch are able to change the funnel, what you, and what Alice mentioned and what I see is your sales team is going to end up when needing to talk to somewhere between eight and 20 people to win the same deal, meaning that your conversion rates are up to a hundred times better. And so when you're looking at it, that from like a sales and marketing alignment standpoint in 2017, it was very, it was, it was very clear on how, to me about how to get sales marketing alignment, give sales people that are ready to buy that help them hit their goals where they don't need to put a hundred percent of quota. They don't need to go and source a hundred percent of their own quota because marketing is actually helping them get to their goal. It feels re really simple, but what happens is organizations set metrics, which incentivize marketers to do the exact opposite of what sales wants, which is drive a bunch of shitty leads that waste their time. And so I'm not even sure really how I got there, but <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I think it's a, it is the MQL hamster wheel, like it, and it's a real thing, and it's hard to move away from sometimes because of your how you're all set up and just the processes. But I would just recommend the way we did it was increment, hit your target, hit your number, earn the right, and then split the funnel, measure both, and like there is no arguments with the conversion. So then you can actually use that as your basis by which to make the business case for more money to siphon budget off from what is less productive into what's more productive. I think that's kind okay. of, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Okay, cool. So and then I wanted to talk to you about like your all-star team because um, obviously as like a marketing guru, I think it's very interesting to hear from you what, like who you select in your team, what are the attributes um, like of an amazing like B2B marketing team for a SaaS company. I and it would be kind of interesting to understand like the inflection points of scale as well, like from your perspective. So um, like what roles can be filled in the early days by freelance and outsource versus what you absolutely need to have in the company? Um, and yeah, how does that kind of change as you scale? Yeah, so um, I'll answer it for a, com a SaaS company after, but I'll just talk through our experience. So we are a marketing company that also hires marketers and so it's unique a lot of people may not be in this situation but because of the way that we execute marketing and because of the things that we believe in we actually just attract the best talent because the best talent recognizes that we see where the world is going and so it's an interesting thing from a, just an overall talent perspective of people like it's not just new customers that our linkedin podcast drives like 
but almost every person that works here was listening to our podcast for three months before they applied to a job here. Right. And so we're getting, we're getting good customers, talent. I believe that it impacts retention. I believe that it impacts existing pipeline, um, obviously long-term growth of the business and brand. And so that is the execution from our own marketing actually attracts good marketers. Now, when, uh, if, when you're a software company, let's just say that it's like 10 million ARR. So you have like, ba you know, you have basic infrastructure and product market fit and things like that. Um, when you're looking for a like demand gen leader, I see a lot of, cause I interview um, a lot of them. Right. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that probably a somewhere, I would say three out of a hundred have the skills to, to make it here. And that doesn't even include like culture or attitude or comp or anything else, just purely based on the technical skills and the way that they look at things. And so as a company, if you don't understand how to evaluate that talent, you're at a huge risk of hiring someone for $200,000 a year or more that sucks. Yeah. And so that's, that's the risk. I, you know, I interview people that work at a Series E SaaS company that's 100 million in revenue, and they can't look at a Salesforce dashboard and tell me what's going on. And so that's what you don't want to have. And so we put together a very solid process here that involves going through Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads, Google ads, Salesforce dashboards to understand how people think, what questions they ask, where they look. Um, we go through a, a project where they have to put together a strategy, present it to executives, work through objections. And so we have built our process to filter out people based on the things that are important to us. Um, and so from a demand gen perspective, like that's, that's the person they need to know where the world is going. They need to know how to execute it. They need to be able to look and figure out how to adjust strategy based on what they're seeing in data or otherwise data can be inside of Salesforce data could also be what people are saying to you or what they're posting on LinkedIn or anything else to continuously build the strategy. What other people might fall into is that they have one thing that they did in 2012 that worked for them when they worked at Salesforce, and they're just going to continue to do it forever. And over time, it's just gotten the effectiveness has gotten worse and worse. And so from a from a demand gen person, that's the way that we look at things. The the look for a performance marketer will be a slightly different. It will also include a lot of technical assessment inside of ad platforms. When you think about um, content marketers. I think that there are a lot of, of people that do content marketing that could be an amazing content marketer that works here. But at the moment they work at a company that doesn't have a sub subject matter expert and is not bought into the content. So therefore the content at the company is not resonating. Right. And so when you think about hiring a, a content marketer, the thinking is, are they the subject matter expert or are they the person that is providing the framework for the subject matter expert to produce content? Yep. Yeah. So I imagine the subject matter expert is not going to have time. They don't want to write. You're going to interview them. You're going to get them the information from them. You're not probably going to get them writing. So exactly. you still need someone to do that. And so um, understanding that when you're hiring a content marketer, if you sell to CISOs, that your content marketer is probably not going to be the one that just comes up with the blog that CISOs love. And so you need to have, you need to figure out who the expert is to put those things together. Were there, any, were there any other roles that you were speaking through or am I kind of on the right track on your question? Yeah, I think the only other thing on it was like freelance outsource versus in-house. So like any of those would you, those would be all ones you'd want to have in-house at this stage of a SaaS company. What about ops, like an ops person? So, um, generally the things that I believe that companies need to prioritize in house are anything that has customer intimacy related to it. So if it requires, or they should start to prioritize around that we understand our customers deeply, we are interacting with them in a community, we produce content they love, you know, we understand who the influential people are in the market. That's the most value that an internal marketing team can provide. They also need to have product marketing, and I believe ops should be um, an in-house function. Yeah. Now, when we think about things that you could get externally, what I believe that companies should use for external is 
frameworks, innovation, um, or execution that is that may not suit their needs to build completely in-house or things that change rapidly where being able to keep up with those things is difficult from an in-house standpoint. And there might be advantages to working with a company that works at, with a hundred companies and sees all that data at the same time. And so I see these types of things emerging. Companies are, I don't think, adopting the way that I've been seeing it, but as a CEO, um, if I, and we're in the process of building products. And so we'll do the exact same thing here is the advice that I'm giving is the, the internal team really needs to be centered around deeply understanding customers. And that is just not what I see companies operate on right now. Yeah, I think that makes sense. It's what, what, can, what can you actually outsource without losing that intimacy of understanding and it not impact the results you're going to get? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's a lot. Yeah, hopefully people take note of that. I really, really would press you to because I've speak to quite a few marketers and um, a lot of the time sort of working with agencies and like different agencies or outsourcing certain aspects of their marketing and then wonder why they're not getting results. But it's because like you cannot possibly expect to get for the cost that they're paying, like anywhere near the knowledge and insight they need for the business to actually see the results on the bottom line. Um, of, amazing. Sorry. This is, yeah. Just <laughs> one random note on here. Um, a lot of companies that have not established product market fit do a couple of different things and then they blame somebody else for not establishing a good strategy at the beginning. They might hire an agency when they're 1 million ARR and they have no idea who their customer is and they're not sure how to message it and they're not sure who wants it. And they're going to blame the agency when they don't get revenue. They also might hire a team of 12 salespeople. And then they'll have six SDRs and six AEs trying to sell a product that they don't know who they're selling to or how to message it. And they're not sure who, sure who wants it. And then they're going to fire half the sales team and blame the sales team for not selling the product when the strategy was wrong. And so um, that's something to think about too. I think a lot of the issues or blaming that happens at that stage comes down to you don't understand your customer. You don't really have product market fit. You haven't defined product market fit well enough. You haven't defined your ICP well enough. Like those are the issues that happen at that stage. Yeah, makes sense. And then a question that's kind of one for me, but I just wanted to, I'm interested because you probably work with loads of them. What do great marketing leaders look like? Like what, what's the secret sauce to that? Like, what are you seeing commonality between a great marketing leader and, and the not so good ones? This goes without selling a saying, but accountability to pipeline and revenue. Um, quick to move on new opportunities and quick to ditch old opportunities that aren't working anymore. Um, Gets their team really focused on the customer, not the all, all of the operations that happen blind to the customer right now. Being able, and then I think one of the most important things that I continue to see is being able to manage the rest of the executive team and the board to do something unique. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. And then I guess like one thing I w- just I was thinking about with a lot of this stuff is actually the way that you're framing how to do marketing going forward. It actually should be like a kind of a blessed relief for marketers because a lot of the stuff that we have to we kind of get told we have to do, we we no longer there's not like a massive need for, like for example just at like lead scoring i think lead scoring is like not a thing that needs to be time needs to be wasted on if you go down this route because what you're saying is actually those leads that are going to complete this form who are coming to the website who are converting have got high intent they are you can maybe literally as simple as icp fit is the score and then hand off like that's how quickly it can be um fit, fit declared intent good to go lead yeah. score I mentioned that on the last one we were on. Lead scoring is binary in my view. They are either ready to buy and firmographically qualified or they're not. Yep. But and I guess it comes back to like if you're still doing MQLs, that's where lead scoring is a thing because actually like obviously they're not all created equally, but which and we, that's why it continually has to be iterated on because the whole point is there is no intent. Like you're stumbling across some random ones that are probably ready to buy, but actually that model's never gonna be accurate because there isn't the intent so like that is something that you can go away and come off the focus and like could free up so much more of your time which I think is great and yeah there is 
struggle there to get buy-in from sales and rest of the organization because it's a thing that they think marketers need to do um but then again if when you split the funnel you look at the conversion rates you can prove the revenue piece then i think you're going to have like an easier conversation around it for sure um the solution to this for people i think this is super important is that you if you're going to executives with this suggestion you must also arrive with a suggestion for how you're going to trigger outbound sales instead of an mql score or mqls and so you can't just be like oh we're not going to do mqls anymore i guess our 20 sdrs are going to have to figure out what to do you need to come with a different solution what companies are moving to right now and getting better results than mqls so it's there's two components one the stuff that we're doing right now isn't working here's the data and Here's what we're going to do instead. We're going to trigger outbound based on intent data from a certain source, first and third party intent data, as opposed to MQLs. So our sales team is going to be talking to people that are more likely to be ready to buy right now. And our marketing team can do way better things. Yeah. And I, and I suppose part of that as well is then marketing function can also be to enable the sequences and the content that the sales team are putting out and actually can sales can become more helpful in the whole buying process than just actually actioning a cadence back on the back of an ebook call and not have a clue what was even in the content or like how it fits to the buy and the buy process. Who would have thought I'd be saying this? Like, gosh, it's a real change. But yeah, um, amazing. Well, I'm conscious of time and like we're like basically running out and we're nearly at the end. So I think we covered pretty much everything that I had that I wanted to um, yeah touch on. And it's been great to have you on, Chris. And um, I know that I've taken a lot from all the content that you guys are putting out and over at Refine Labs and been putting it into our processes at Cognizant. So if we can do it, like, honestly, anyone can do it. Um, yeah. And hopefully this was demystifying some of it a bit and giving some extra insight. Don't know if there's anything else you want to add, Chris, before we, we leave. Um, I don't think there's anything much to add except for the fact that, like, we have 30 companies that we work with directly that are doing this and a lot of other companies like Alice and others that are just executing this on their own and getting dramatically better results. And so I just couldn't emphasize enough the just like massive opportunity, both for your company, but also for your career in terms of moving and learning new ways to execute marketing. Because if we stay in this MQL lead gen performance marketing mindset, these things are going to get automated out like software can almost do this job already and we need as marketers to move way more into customer focus way more into art way more into correlation instead of direct attribution i just i cannot emphasize enough the opportunity both for you and your company by trying to get familiar with some of these approaches and it will make our jobs a lot more fun i mean like who wants to be looking at lead score models and um yeah cycling through mqls i definitely don't so that's been great thanks chris really appreciate it it's gonna cut us off so um yeah thank you for the time and it was great to chat and i'm gonna keep on yeah keeping on let's do it keep me posted bye everyone bye